All right. You know, that idea is around a lot, that a cardinal, the bird kind, uh, might be the embodiment somehow of somebody who has passed. And we are, where I live, we have a very cardinal-positive environment. We have a lot of cardinals there. I, I don't know who they are, you know, besides cardinals, but they might be somebody else. All right. Today is Ask or Tell Me Anything. I'm just back from a week off, in which I relax, sort of. The problem with relaxing, if you run on adrenaline most of the time, is that when you relax, you realize how tired you are. <laughs> I mean, the minute the, the adrenaline shuts off, you realize you're, you're basically, you know, a piece of jello. Uh, so anyway, but it was nice to relax. Uh, the number, if you want to call in and make trouble or, or invite feelings of delight in the universe, 888-720-9677, 888-720-9677. Seven two zero WNPR, and just to give you an example of how exciting one of these phone calls can be, let us talk to. I have to remember how the new phone system works now. Uh, let us talk to William in Middletown. Hi, William. Oh, hi. Um, I um, um, I was very nervous to make this call, but um, I have been um, uh, listening to the political news. All I listen to is NPR, and uh, the. Um, uh, presentation of anything having to do with President President Biden seems to be negative, and I won't go into all the different reasons for that. But um, I've been wondering lately is how much polls are creating news, um, you know, because when I hear um, something about well, the President Biden's forty um, percent down, forty percent up, forty percent considered good too, but um, you know, about this issue or about that issue. Now, the one thing that is very difficult for me to come to terms to is his decision, decisions about supporting Israel, and my son and I have great discussions about that. But um, I also, um, and, and I tell him that I'm very worried about the political climate and as much criticism as could be leveled at President Biden. I just am so worried about the alternative. And and it's got me in a a kind of messed up state. (laughs) So anyway, that's why I was calling. I don't know if I made any sense. No, you made sense. So let me just say a few things about this. First of all, yeah, there obviously is some kind of feedback loop that goes on you know, you could even just localize it to say the New York Times. So the New York Times does three or four stories about Biden's mentation or his you know, aging issues or whatever. Uh, and then there's a poll that they publish saying that people are really worried about his mentation, and his aging issues. And they publish the results of that poll as if they had nothing to do with creating that feedback loop. So you're, you're right about that. Here's some pieces of good news. I think, first of all, Biden's numbers are bubbling up a little bit. You should never look at one poll. We'll start there. I teach this. I mm. teach this in college. Never look at one poll. One poll is always meaningless. Uh, what you want to look at is either a lot of polls, a lot of polls by different polling in- entities, and see how they're averaging. But the most important thing is to look at trends, because a poll may not be exactly right. It may be wrongly weighted. It may be, you know, just just a, you know, accidentally or perversely bad sample. Um, but if you look at trend lines, you can kind of see where things are going. Uh, and so watch trends. I, I think I haven't looked at Biden's trends lately, but, you know, post State of the Union address, he seemed to be doing a lot better. And the other part of this, William, is that, you know, a, the vast majority of the American electorate is totally checked out about this election uh, and will be yeah. until after Labor Day. Uh, and then a lot more of them will start tuning in. I think they're very checked out right now on the sheer weirdness of Donald Trump, that Donald Trump has gotten weirder and weirder and weirder. And I think a lot of people have him kind of frozen at a previously weird moment. And what they don't understand, he's up there screaming about bloodbaths and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, he's really, yeah. you know, and he's he's claiming that, that Biden beat Obama in an election. <laughs> I mean, he, you know, he's getting really strange. But but I, mm-hmm. I don't think people will tune into that for a while. I mean, they're checked out also because they don't like the choice. You know, they wish they had a better choice. Um, you know, I, I, I think some of that will change. Typically, people get a lot more engaged sometime around Labor Day because they realize it's really happening. <laughs> you know, it's actually going to happen. It isn't just a theoretical thing. So watch the numbers then. You know, I think Biden's numbers will become more meaningful. But I, I think there is a, um, a kind of um, doom cycling that you can do about polling that's 
and you can get yourself kind of worked up about something that may not all be all that meaningful. Um, you know, we'll see hey, where Colin, we Colin, you yeah. have reassured me. Oh, good. And um, I, I appreciate that. I feel a little bit more relaxed now because everything you said makes perfect sense. And I probably knew it, but I wasn't. It wasn't in the front part of my brain. So I appreciate it. All right. No problem at all. Uh, thanks for calling in. So um, I think, okay, I have to adjudicate something here. Um, okay, hold on. Hang on. Hang on. Okay. Uh, all right. So just back to um, what I was saying, talking about before. Oh, I want to say a couple of things about what we're doing this week. Um, this week, uh, we are going to, on Thursday, do something that we do every year, which is our March Madness show. We always have uh, two March Madness permanent pundits on. Julia Pastel and Bill Curry. We usually have the uh, president of an obscure college on. Uh, and um, we'll have some other surprises for you. I think this year is kind of interesting, though. This is the first year where I would say that, um, that the women's bracket, I mean, the women's bracket is always interesting. And here in Connecticut, we're really interested in women's basketball. And so I don't want to suggest that it's not interesting. Um, ordinarily, but I, I, you know, other people have made this point. You could make the case that there's more going on in the women's bracket than on in the men's bracket this year. That, and one of the things we're going to have to do, we tend to tilt our mag, our March madness show over the years towards the men's bracket. Cause that's typically where there has been more interest. And there still is, I think generally more interest, but with Caitlin Clark in the picture, um, with the incredible rival rivalry between Southern Carolina, South Carolina, and uh, and LSU, which included a fight the last time they played, causing South Carolina's center to be suspended for a game, which so she'll miss the first game of March Madness. I mean, there's just a lot going on there, and so we will be attempting, I think, to sort of adjust our calipers a little bit, make sure that we um, talk a, a lot about the women's bracket as well as the men's bracket. Uh, and that's about it. That's all I have to say. All right. So, um, I'm going to assign a name to this person or we'll, we'll just call this person private. I think private is a good name for this person. All right. So here we go. We're going to talk to private. Hi, you're on the air. Hi. Uh, I'm calling in regards to what, uh, these internet companies are doing, the Uber, the Lyft, uh, the DoorDash and all the others that are out there. Uh, we were wanting to know, because we even called the governor's office to ask them for help, and they said, what do you want us to do? They are internet companies out of uh, California, and we can't fight them. And that's really very disappointing, knowing that these companies are stealing drivers' com uh, money from as much as from 30% to 90%. They steal the tips. They do not, they put us in a tier system that basically locks us out from very lucrative work. And this is a dispatch company. And why is a dispatch company is taking away most of the driver's money that are out there working on a daily basis? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I've heard this complaint before. Uh, and... I, I think the answer ultimately is going to be that, first of all, there needs to be even more publicity and news coverage of some of these problems, but also probably there needs to, there need to be better companies to co that compete with them. Um, I, I think if people understood some of the things that you're saying, and then if another company came along or one of these companies dramatically adjusted its behavior in a very highly publicized way, I think people don't want to deal with unethical companies if they have a choice. So I, it, we create a more diverse marketplace. Uh, maybe something can be done. I mean, you know, ideally you'd have some regulation there. Probably, yeah. probably take enabling legislation from Congress. I don't know how good they would be at that. But, um, but good luck with all that. Let me give out the number again: eight 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 seven two zero nine six seven seven. That's eight 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 seven two zero WNPR. You know, the other thing that's weird about coming back from a break, you come back with a sort of weird combination of listlessness, <laughs> the listlessness that you kind of bought into while you were on vacation and an energy because, you know, you haven't really had to navigate anything with anybody for a while. And so I came back bursting with ideas. I think my, my producers are scared to look at Slack right now because I'm going to put up another idea for a show. Actually, I do have another idea for a show that I'm going to put up on Slack. So, um, um, I, I'm just sort of in, you know, I'm in that kind of odd 
gray area transitional liminal mood coming back from vacation. All right. I'm going to do something that I typically don't do. By the way, let me go give out the number again. We have lots of open lines here on our fancy new phone system. 888-720-9677. 888-720-WNPR. Those are both the same number, but you know, one of them is alphanumeric. Okay, so so while you're calling, so I'm going to open. So I, we have this thing, and I haven't done it in a while. And it's, these are called the Mr. Carp envelopes. And I'm not going to tell you the whole Mr. Carp backstory right now because it takes too long. This Mr. Carp is very smart. I went to college with him. It's, you know, I mean, you, I, I, I have made the case that he was the smartest person that I attended college with. And he's done very well for himself. Despite having done, I mean, he's done very well for himself. By any metric, he's done very well for himself. Despite that, <laughs> despite that, he never, he sends um, envelopes full of clippings to me and other people. And he does not buy new envelopes. He just he takes envelopes that he has received and he repurposes them. And he, <laughs> he, he the, the, it always looks like the mail has been tampered with <laughs> because he takes an envelope that somebody sent to him. He opens that envelope, he takes out the things, then he puts the clips in and then he like scotch tapes it closed and stuff like that. I mean, this man, <laughs> this man, you know, when Taylor Swift was living in Watch Hill, Mr. Carper was Taylor Swift's next door neighbor. Let's let's put it that way, all right? He he could get new envelopes. And I respect that. He's taking care of the environment. But I'm gonna open one of these envelopes today. Um, even if nobody asks me, I usually wait to see if anybody asks me to do it. But somebody sort of did ask me to do it. Gerard, uh Gerard, I'll say his whole name, Gerard O'Sullivan, in an email said that he was he always hopes that we're gonna open a Mr. Carp envelope on one of these shows. So we're gonna do that today just for him. All right, here we go. Um, can he? De, 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 uh, all right, so um, I'll, I'll see if I can answer this question correctly. Oh, I think I did something wrong. Did I do something wrong there? I think I might have done something wrong. Where'd he go? Uh, uh, I was just sort of randomly clicking on a box here on our fancy new phone system, and I think he went away. His question was, I think his question was, can Donald Trump pardon himself if he is... If he's not guilty, if he's been found not guilty, I, I, I judging from what's happened in the past, I, first of all, I'm not a constitutional law expert. I'm just going from memory. But I, I think, for example, that Ford gave Nixon a kind of blanket pardon. I mean, I think Ford pardoned Nixon for everything. Um, so I'm guessing that, yes, I know, obviously that's a little bit different from pardoning oneself. Um, but, um, but I think it might be possible for, for Trump to issue, I mean, if he can issue a pardon for, to, to other people and if it's decided, which apparently it seems to be kind of latently decided that he could pardon himself as president, um, that he could uh, pardon himself kind of on a blanket basis. Now, that would be on a bit bank, uh, blanket federal basis. It's kind of why this, this case in Georgia is um, of great interest because that's a state case. I don't think the president can pardon himself for um, for crimes committed uh, under local jurisdiction, under state jurisdiction. So, so there we go. Okay, so we're going to go to the phones now. 888-720-9677, 888-720-WNPR. Excitement is also building about opening a Mr. Carp envelope. But here we go. Here's Chris. Hi, Chris. Hey. Um, so my son uh, just got married, has a good job has a dog so he'd like to buy a house you know with a backyard that sort of thing and it's really been interesting to compare his experience to our experience uh when we bought first of all we didn't have a lot of expectations in terms of that the house is going to be just so but you know the second thing was when we were getting a mortgage in the late 80s the mortgage rate was like seven or eight percent. Uh, so it's just a different expectation, I think. Uh, but there's been some, we talked about the New York Times, they uh, have been coming out with articles, and these are just developments uh, with, uh, in terms of realtor fees and also other fees that uh, have, are being charged. You have to pay you're, you're, you have a, if you're a buyer, you have a realtor. If you're a seller, you have to realtor. And then you, 
when you're buying a house, you have to pay both of them. And uh, it's just interesting. A lot of the stuff is coming out that really adds to the cost and, you know, the base price of houses because they were building for wealthy people and not for poor people. I think that I think I think that's the biggest part of this. I mean, the real trophies yeah. have been around essentially forever. They were around when you and I yeah. were buying houses. But I think yes, what we're seeing right now, first of all, is the generational problem, often expressed as yep. millennials have the kids, boomers have the houses. Um, so um, yeah, you've got a, a group of uh, a millennial generational cohort. They're starting to have kids. It makes sense. They want to you know have a house with a yard, all that kind of stuff. It's really hard. It's really difficult. And I think you put your finger on one of the big drivers of it, which is that um, the houses are not really being built. Starter houses are, are and they've all, it's always been a struggle for, to, to find developers who want to build starter houses because the margins on a McMansion are just going to be bigger. You know, I mean, you are going, the profit margins will always be bigger for those houses. Well, will be typically be big, bigger for those houses. So, I, I think, and, and there's the other problem, which is that the boomers have stayed in their houses uh, longer. We do, we don't have multi generational housing in this country, maybe the way we we might have even in say 1950, where you might have you know grandma living with a nuclear family, or there's less of that kind of stuff. And so, and boomers are living longer than previous generational cohorts, so they're hanging on to their house and they're staying younger longer. So they hang on to their houses longer. Those houses don't go on the market. I mean, eventually, there will be some kind of turning point, some kind of cliff where people like me age out of housing, house, home ownership, and, and the, right. the supply will increase. Yeah. But I mean, that might be too late for your son. But it's a real problem. And unless government, this is one, one place where government does need to in intervene and create incentives for building starter homes. And, and I mean, this is my, one of my first, my first, job in 1976, my first real job in 1976, I was the Glastonbury reporter for the Hartford Current, and some developers there realized something that is still a problem. It, that was 1976. It is still a problem, which is that people who work for towns, if the towns are upscale, you know, if it's Glastonbury or God forbid New Canaan or someplace like that, um, people who work there can't live there. And, and, you know, it's not an unreasonable thing to want to live where you work. You don't want to have to drive 30 minutes. And, and in, I've said, I've made this speech before, but I'll say it again. The other problem in Connecticut is because we didn't develop anything sensibly. We developed things with edge cities and office parks. And so there isn't even any kind of, I mean, you often will have a husband and wife and the husband works in an office park in Farmington and the wife works in, you know, some edge city development and, you know, in, I don't know, Longmeadow, Massachusetts or something. I mean, you have to figure out where you could even buy a house where you could both get to your jobs. It's a, a terrible situation and it, it is, it is considerably worse. But anyway, one thing that Glastonbury did in 76 was they, they created a development. I mean, they helped a developer, allowed a developer who wanted to build affordable housing, uh, to create something called Terra Hill. And, and the, Town got really, really nervous about this, and they thought, "Oh, all kinds of undesirable people, people who cannot afford insanely expensive homes, are going to come here." But it was really, you know, it was the fire, the firefighter. It was the person who, you know, works in the zoning office in town or something like that. It was just people they really knew and encountered every day in their jobs. It was, you know, it, it was the manager of the restaurant they went to for lunch. That person was suddenly able to buy a house in town. There's nothing wrong with that. We just have to make it a priority. Anyway, thanks for your call. Uh, all right. So, um, hmm, 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 hmm. all right. Well, yeah, we have to do this. Uh, so here we go. Oh, we're going to go to Kim. Kim in in New Fairfield. Hi, Kim. You're on the air. Hey, Colin. Great to talk with you. Uh, I'm wanting to get your take uh, on the whole Princess Catherine situation. Not so much. I mean, I would love to hear what you think's going on, but I'm just interested in the amount of speculation and amateur sleuthing that I'm seeing on social media, particularly TikTok. And I don't think I've ever seen this amount of sometimes sleuthing, sometimes conspiracy theories over a, a topic before. Yeah. No, first of all, I think you, you put your finger on that really nicely. I mean, we've internet culture thrives on this stuff and, and we've all turned into internet sleuths and that's why true crime podcast, part of why true crime podcasts are so popular, starting with serial, you know, it was like, Oh, I can solve this. I can figure this out. I'm going to write down all the details and I'm going to go online. I'm going to research some other details. So you start there. We have that natural inquisitiveness. It's part of the species. And then you have 
media like podcasts and TikTok that kind of feed that or create opportunities to do that. And then you also have a tripwire of anxiety about AI and deep fakes and stuff like that. Are we going to be fooled by something? Are we going to be, are we at greater risk these days of being fooled? So when they put that picture out uh, simultaneously with the state of the union address, I was just, you know, doing the usual social media thing on X and I was realizing that, that Biden was having a great state of the union address, but, Kate Middleton or people, you know, want to, wanting to debunk that picture were being to push him out to the margins a little bit. And, and I think there, this also feels a little bit like a practice run that we are going to be confronted with more sophisticated deep fakes than that picture going forward. And I think people are worried and wondering, will we be able to pick that kind of thing up? Um, so what else do I want to say about that? Oh, you know, the other thing that's odd about this is like, I just did it too. It's funny how she's all still called Kate Middleton all the time. I mean, that's not her name. <laughs> it was her name, but it's, just, it's it's like she never, it would be like if we only ever called Princess Diana, Diana Spencer. Um, it just seems kind of an odd thing the way we've, we've stuck with that. But, and, and I think the other thing that's happened that's really weird. And I, I saw a post about this, I think within the last 24 hours, you know, the crown, the terrific um, series, Peter Morgan series that ran on Netflix for so many seasons, they, they shut down. They said, okay, that's good. We're done. And now there's the Princess Catherine. Let's I'll do what you did and call her that. The Princess of Wales, whatever we want to call her. There's that. Then you may know. I shouldn't even say this on the air. So I'm just going to say this is a rumor that was all over social media. And there is, to the best of my knowledge, no meat on the bones unless something has happened in the last hour or two. But yesterday there was this incredible a flurry of rumor mongering about the idea that uh, King Charles had died and that he died on St. Patrick's Day. And so that's why the, uh, the palace didn't want to announce it. Uh, and because of God knows what would be made of that. But I think the, partly the series, the crown and, and, and probably a few other details as well has, has made us maybe semi-permanently more interested in the Windsors in the Royal family than we previously were. I mean, I don't know. I grew up not caring very much about this stuff at all. And now I I seem to know way, way too much about it. So I think when you get a real media circus, when you get, um, you know, uh, a thing where everybody's suddenly paying attention to something, a lot of things have to play into that. But one of them is a technological anxiety, a fear of, oh, my God, what if people start showing us stuff that looks real and it's not? And this turned out to be one of the big test cases. So anyway, Kim, thanks for your call. We should take a little break here. John from West Hartford is already on the line. You may get on the line, too, by calling 888-720-9677, 888-720-WNPR. And we are back. This is Ask or Tell Me Anything. The number is 888-720-9677. We have no plan, no guests, no prearranged topics. You have to call 888-720-WNPR and tell me what the topics are. And, for example, John is just, oh, we, and we will be opening a Mr. Carp envelope very soon. And I don't know what's in these. I mean, that's the way that works. I don't, I have no idea what's in them. And I will try to talk. I will try to talk about whatever's in them. I'm partly laughing because my friend David Edelstein pointed out to me at one point that this has never worked very well. Like usually I open the envelope and there's just stuff in it that I don't have anything. First of all, you have to read it really fast. Like, what is it? What am I looking at here? So, so something that we have apparently never done 
successfully or particularly satisfyingly, we are going to do again in a few minutes. But uh, meanwhile, we have to talk to John, John in West Hartford. Hi, John. You have the floor. Hi. Um, I really just was interested in hearing your thoughts on the proposed budget cuts at UConn. I don't really see it anywhere in the local news. I haven't seen it on TV or wherever, or on NPR, really. And they're discussing, like, the governor has proposed these really steep cuts to higher education across the state, their budgets. The president of the UConn has proposed these really draconian budget cuts, which would basically destroy large swaths of UConn's academic pro- programs. But on the other hand, they're also guaranteeing no cuts to sports teams or athletics, but that's another issue. I just <laughs> wonder what you thought about that. Yeah, first of all, I would say I would uh, salute our colleagues over at the Connecticut Mirror. Um, they do a lot of really good coverage of public institutions in general, and they do a good job of covering UConn. If you feel like you're not reading much about it, I would go over there and see what they're doing. They're usually really on top of this stuff. I also want to say that in my experience, covering UConn and covering this kind of stuff, it's it's really it's it's a difficult thing to parachute in and do. There's just a lot of layers and complexity, and what it, whatever I say is going to be woefully underinformed. Not that I'm going to let that stop me, mind you, but the reality is that if you don't spend a lot of time looking at this stuff, you're probably going to get things wrong. So I'll just say this. I believe the proposed cuts are $70 million out of a $1.6 billion budget, which, I mean, that doesn't even really seem that large, but but I guess, I mean, as a percentage or something, but I guess it is. Um, I I, I think my own crude perspective, it goes something like this. UConn, for a long time, has essentially had two missions, which were not entirely supportive of one another. Uh, They weren't mutually exclusive of one another, but not fully supportive of one another. One of them is to educate students, give them them the means by which they may attain uh, a bachelor's degree or something else, and then go forward into the world as educated human beings. That's number one. The the other one is to become a first-class, world-class research institution, and certainly under the regime of Susan Herbst, and maybe some of the other presidents as well, there was the idea that this would throw off a lot of money that they would be getting a lot of patents and stuff like that, and, and that that would help support the other mission. I don't think that that's really happened all that much. Once again, you, we would really need to talk to somebody way better informed about this than me to, 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 to explore that particular question. But, you know, I certainly, you know, I have actually a family member who's probably going to be starting at UConn in September, so I'm suddenly very interested in all this stuff. And, and yeah, I mean, I, I think ultimately we have to have a reckoning. And the reckoning is to what degree do we want to use state monies to support UConn more? Uh, to what degree can the UConn Foundation come up with no, more money? You hate to hit people with more tuition because tuition is already just, you know, it's it's higher than we were accustomed to thinking of it being at a lot of public institutions. You know, it's, it's a debt that nobody really wants to pay, but there's a, obviously a pretty significant shortfall there. So, um, so yeah, I mean, my understanding anyway is the deficit is around seventy million. I forget exactly what what that amounts to in terms of what they're going to do with cuts. Um, and and I, I don't really have a dispositive take on it. It it is it, it is one of those Gordian knots that you can't just slice all the way through. Um, probably a lot of different adjustments are going to have to be made. Um, so I don't know. And that's not a very satisfactory answer. But like I said. <laughs> If you don't specialize in this, nobody should pay any attention to what you say anyway. Right. I mean, Alexander did actually cut through the Gordian he did. knot. He so, did. You know, we can actually cut through it. Yeah. Right. But the problem is when the, at- when the Gordian knot is the financing of education, cutting through it is probably not a great idea because then, then you have an even more broken system. So it was my fault for using Gordian knot as an image. <laughs> right. I mean, the image of solving the problem, not cutting the budget even further. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. If you I look mean, at- You'd, you'd want to see you, you want to see what potential new new revenue streams there are. Uh, you'd want to see whether there are any easy save, savings to recoup. I'm guessing not because this budget has already faced you know quite a few cuts over the years. I don't think there's any you know any low hanging fruit there to be cut. Um, no. Yeah, you at know. At this point, you go ahead. At this point, right? The the budget cuts would mean 
you know, the elimination of entire graduate programs, mm. the using teachers, professors to have, you know, only huge 200 person classes. Like these are things that would make it not a worthwhile university to go to, especially if they're going to raise tuition rates. Yeah. What if we let this, uh, it, what if we let the professors get sneaker contracts? I'm just wondering whether that opens up something, you know, why should, I mean, why should the coaches have them and, and nobody else? Uh, right. Well, I mean, the other, the other huge problem is this kind of neoliberal fetishization of budget cuts and these ideas of like universities having to have turning profits, right? The benefits of universities may not be directly measurable, at least not instantly, right? Most of the professionals in Connecticut, many of them are UConn graduates, you know, all, most of your lawyers and doc or accountants and the like in Connecticut were trained at UConn. It's not... It's not an immediate return of like, I purchase of a business of selling a thing and that thing turns a profit, right? These are nonprofit organizations meant for the benefit of society as but, a whole. But the as you're suggesting, yeah, as you're suggesting, they started to be envisioned in a different way. And, and I think that was very much the Herbst model was, you know, we are going to go into business. We are going to be getting patents. Uh, you know, we are going, going to uh, open sure. up a huge gushing oil wells of revenue. I, all I can say is I, I pray that by the time that baby in the background is ready to go to college that we solve this problem. All right, our numbers, 888-720-9677, 888-720-WNPR. And uh, all right, we got Michael. I think Michael's responding to other things. We like it when people respond to other things. And so here is Michael to do so. Hi, Michael. Hi. Um the first thing, just quickly, she's Kate Middleton because um, she was not royalty. Uh, Diana Spencer was always known as Lady Di, sort of from the time they first started dating, and uh, her and Prince Charles. Um, and also, she was also known for a while as Weighty Katie because she um, uh, took some time to uh, get a ring on it. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, why she's known as Kate Middleton. Um, I salute your expertise in is, these matters. Uh, I actually just read an article somewhere about right. it, and somebody asked that very question. So, yeah. um, the other thing is about housing. Uh, HB fifty three ninety just cleared the General Assembly, came out of committee. That's um, work live ride, uh, and that it, it's been around for a while. Uh, I think this is its second or third time through the ringer. Uh, hopefully it'll pass this year. And that's all about um, the transit-oriented communities mm. and being able to build by right within, I think, a quarter mile of transit. Um, and the other one is SB 343, which um, allows single-stair buildings, which is basically, if you go into an apartment building nowadays, mm -hmm. um, 90% of them are like a long corridor. It's like a hotel. Mm -hmm. We have a long corridor and buildings on either and rooms off either side. Uh, single stair is like if you go to Europe and you go to, you know, if you know somebody who lives in Europe, chances are they live in a single stair building, which is where you usually have um, an elevator and a single stair. And what that does is that allows you to build three and four bedroom apartments. Um, this becomes very important when the aforementioned older couple who are living in a five-bedroom house somewhere uh, want to downsize, and they can't. Mm. It's not that they don't want to downsize. It's that they can't downsize because we're not building any, you know, three-bedroom apartments that are under, you know, $2 million. So I, I, like, those I, are, uh, I like that you're citing both of these bills because I think we're going to have to get there unfortunately, through incentives, through uh, bills that enable things, bills that mandate or require things in, in the form of affordable housing, although I 100% I approve of those efforts. One of the difficulties of Connecticut is convincing, say, Darien that it has to follow a rule. I mean, a lot of these municipalities think of, think of themselves as essentially sovereign states. Uh, and so saying you have to build X percent of affordable housing or something. It just, they, they just find ways not to do it. Um, but you know, the stuff that you're talking about sounds good. It sounds volitional, uh, which is probably an easier way to get people in Connecticut to do things. They like to think it was their idea or that they're going along with something they want to do. All right. So it's ask or tell me anything. It's 888-720-9677. 888-720-WNPR. I think the time has come while people are calling in here. I think the time might have come. 
to open ah to open a Mr. Carp envelope or to drop a Mr. Carp envelope on the floor. All right, so Mr. Carp, once again, to revisit, he sends me these envelopes. I never know what's going to be in them. And, and I want to say that, you know, for four of them to arrive in one week is low output. I mean, I get more than that, more envelopes than that. All right, so we're going to open this one. It's a recent one. Seem to be quite a few clippings. The clippings are also very heavily underlined, which may help me get to the bottom of things. Or not. Oh, wow, there's a lot of them. All right. This is the part that Edelstein says doesn't work, I think, when I'm trying to figure out what these things are about. Okay. Uh, um, hmm. No, that's not going to work. Never mind. <laughs> a lot of them are from the Wall Street Journal because he knows I don't have a subscription. Uh, Mindy Kaling on egg freezing and advice from Oprah. No, I think I'm going to skip that one. Um, why did you think I would be interested in that? All right. You better call in here because this envelope thing, Edelstein's right. It just doesn't really work very well. Okay. I'm not really sure what this is for. Quinnipiac grad was brainchild of Elmo, Elmo's mental health check-in. Does Elmo have, like, mental health problems or something? I, I, I'm way behind the story. I have to put that one aside. That's not working either. All right. And we'll try one more of the clips from here. Oh, this might work. This might work. Here's a column uh, by Barton Swaim, who I believe is a pretty conservative columnist. Uh, and the headline is, Bring Back the Smoke-Filled Rooms. All right. Um, he says, What else about American politics? Uh, he's uh, citing a new book, The Primary Solution, Rescuing Our Democracy from the Fringes. Uh, simple answer, party primaries. The book has more to do with congressional and state-level races than with presidential one, but its appearance just before uh, Super Tuesday, yada, yada, nonprofit dedicated to abolishing partisan primaries offers some legitimate complaints. Republican primaries are increasingly populated by cranks and conspiracy theorists, Democratic ones by activist class ideologues, particularly in the deeply red and blue districts, blah, 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 blah. I think I know what the, th the thrust of this is. Which is that, so circa, let's see what, 70s and 80s, I think, is sort of the uh, right time to pinpoint our shift away from convention politics, from boss-dominated politics towards primaries. The idea being to, to put more power in the hands of the individual registered voter, party-affiliated registered voter, if you don't have open primaries. And that this has, and I think there is... There's something to this argument. I wouldn't want to buy in too far. I wouldn't want to overcommit to it. But I think what we've seen now is that people, that politicians, people, members of Congress in particular, are more afraid of primaries than they are of general elections. Now, part of the problem there is their districts are, gen, are gerrymandered. So if they're um, a long-sitting Republican, they're not really afraid of Democrats. They're afraid of other Republicans, vice versa. If they're a long-sitting Democrat, they might be way more afraid of a Democratic primary than a Republican uh, opponent in a general election. Um, so so I get all of that. And, and so what that, what that may, means is that the partisanship gets more hardened off, right? You have to kind of prove your worth. You have to get that red badge of courage. You have to show that you're, you know, really more, you're even less flexible uh, about partisan differences than you might ordinarily be. You have to prove that you're completely un inflexible and unwilling to work on a bipartisan basis or to moderate your approach in any way, because otherwise you'll get primaried by somebody who's to the right or left of you, um, depending on which thing you are. So I get that as the problem. I'm not really sure that smoke-filled rooms, boss politics, that kind of stuff is the right solution. Um, I think the right solution, and I, I, I have to say that I've maybe been, I'm a little bit late to this party. Um, I mean, all my Zoomer and millennial producers are all in favor of ranked choice voting. I'm starting to see why that is. I'm also starting to see why systems like the California one, which we are seeing both its strengths and its weaknesses right now, but run, runoff style elections m might be a, a better way to go. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I understand the sense that the system right now is malfunctioning. It wouldn't be an overstatement to call it broken. Um, what the fix is going to be is a little bit more complicated than that. I don't necessarily think that re-entrusting it to kind of patriarchal systems of bosses and smoke-filled rooms is necessarily the right way to go. All right. So um, that's the end of the, 
<laughs> Mr. Carl Envelope. I had to go through five clips to find one that I had anything to say about. So uh, we're going to take a little break. We'll come back with more. Will I ever find the right love to capture Barbara? Our technical producer today is Cat Pastor. Gene Amatruda was in here making sure everything worked. He's our master uh, engineer and Yoda uh, Jedi figure. Uh, the producer of today's show and the call screener is our senior producer, Lily Tyson, who also, it turns out, knows what the Elmo thing was about, which is one of the clips that I, I fumbled. So it turns out now I'm seeing it. It is kind of interesting. So on January 29th, uh, on his or its... <laughs> media social media account um elmo checked in with everybody and uh, posted elmo is just checking in how is everybody doing uh and that was posted on the sesame street characters x formerly twitter account you know elmo is still on x i just feel like you know maybe he shouldn't be uh and the post went viral <laughs> just how's everybody doing <laughs> went viral uh, and uh, was viewed over 28 million times, reposted 61,000 times, liked over 163,000 times, and received more than 20,000 comments as of February 13th. And and I think the the lesson here was people people need to be asked that more often. I'm not quite sure what the I mean. And and apparently there were a lot of people talking about trauma but also talking about happiness. Uh, I'm reading, those comments shared both moments of happiness and trauma, some even coming from notable figures like Chance the Rapper and Connecticut Native and Today Show host Craig Melvin. Uh, and anyway, um, so maybe we just need to do that more often, right? Maybe we just, in general, how are you? I should have done that at the beginning of today's show. I'll do it now. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it as Elmo. Colin is just checking in. How is everybody doing? If you want to answer that question, you can call 888-720-9677. 888-720-9677. Speaking of how we're doing, one of the things we're going to do on Wednesdays is we're going to do an episode about being wrong. Um, <laughs> which I, I, you know, I, I often don't feel qualified to host all the episodes of the show that we do, but I, I, I host them anyway. Um, you know, the one about being wrong... I think I'm really, we're in my zone of expertise. Uh, anyway, the number if you want to call right now. And say how you're doing. 888-720-9677. 888-720-WNPR. We have time left in the show, and we have open lines right now uh, if you want to call in. So um, I, I do want to talk about this idea of being wrong for a second. Maybe set you up for the excitement of Wednesday's show. One of the things that I thought about right away when uh, McCusker, the, the, uh, McCusker the Wonder Kid and her bad cat, Penelope, pr first proposed this show, the person I first thought about is a guy named Phil Tetlock. Phil Tetlock, I think he's still at UPenn, but he might have branched out on his own or something. Phil Tetlock is a guy who's been on this show. What he studies, he studies forecasters, and he particularly studies people who are good at predicting things well. In other words, if you ask them a question about, I don't know, are oil prices going to go down or something like that? They're really, really good at answering it. But they're also, the same people are good at answering a question totally different from that. They're just good at predicting things. And Tetlock found that they were in no obvious profession. I mean, no profession that would be connected to it. I mean, one of the people that he found was, I believe, a retired ballerina. Another person was a truck driver. They just asked really good questions. They asked good questions that would help them come up with a viable prediction. And so Tetlock started to call them super forecasters. But the flip side of it was that Tetlock started to realize how rarely anybody is penalized for not being good at this kind of thing. <laughs> and in particular, people like me, people who are pundits, people who are commentators uh, in journalism uh, environments, stuff like that, um, that we are, you know, we're terrible at it. We get, we predict things that don't happen. We, we call things wrong. And nobody ever pays a price for it. Um, so I, that is one of the things I think that we will be, explore, be uh, exploring on. Uh, I, I discovered today that Italy tried 
put on trial for manslaughter, I think, a bunch of earthquake scientists because they, they were wrong. They, they failed to predict a really bad earthquake. Now, I'm not in favor of that kind of thing, that you get tried for manslaughter if you don't come up with the right prediction for the earthquakes. But probably, you know, people like me, we should you know, get our pay doctor something if we get things wrong all the time, if we predict things wrong. All right, here is Bob from Southbury. Hi, Bob. Yeah, hi, Colin. How are you? Um, I'm talk, calling about an old Bob Steele word for the day. If you, re, I know you remember him, and the word he re, would repeat words that would get him upset because no one would get it correct. And the word I'm calling about is fort. And he he was always upset because everyone pronounces it forte, but the correct pronunciation was fort. Tell me if I'm right or wrong on this. Well, I mean, this is something my father was was very keen about as well. I think, unfortunately, I mean, if Peter uh, Sokolowski or any other lexicographer were here right now, he or they would say, you know, it, ultimately the way that people use language, the the descriptive. Uh, way um, there, there's sort of two you know, schools of thought. Do you have prescriptive language where you tell say people it's fort, not forte, or another Bob Steelism, E R R is pronounced er, not air. And you're not going to err on the side of caution. You err on the side of caution. The problem is if everybody says it forte and air, um, then you're kind of shoveling against the tide. Um, you know, you're you're going to lose. Language changes by the way people use language. I mean, we don't have a, the the equivalent of a French Academy that can can adjudicate our language, um, and we don't have referees who can make calls. So uh, ultimately, language rules are descriptive. They're you know the, it's sort of if, if ninety percent of the people or eighty percent of the people are doing a certain thing, that becomes the rule, no matter what the old rule was. And I know as we age, that becomes un unsatisfying to us. Uh, but, uh, but there we go. All right. We have 90 seconds left in the whole show. I'm going to just, I'm going to put Lori on the air anyway. We're going to have to do this fast, Lori, but I think we can do it. Oh my gosh. Uh, this, there's not enough time. I know. My, you should have called earlier because, when I was opening I that know. envelope. You should have been calling. I know, I know. <laughs> because, you know, it's a, the very serious topic of Emma Stone winning best actress instead of, uh, Lily Gladstone. And, how I'm just like, yes, of course, Emma did an amazing job, but it was kind of like, you know, it was a kind of amazing job that happens when you get to like jump up and down and be crazy and loud. And do you know what I mean? Yes. I mean, sort so like a, I'll, I'll invoke, I'll very quickly invoke the, the William, William Goldman, the great screenwriter used to say that the flashy performances are the easier ones that in fact, Tom Cruise has a harder job in Rain Man than Dustin Hoffman does because he has to be kind of normal and sell the abnormality or the strangeness or whatever you want to call this to the audience. He has to be our connection. That's a harder job to do. And, and in that way, you could make the argument that Lily Gladstone did a better job of that kind of thing. But we have to stop there and we will do that. Uh, and we will thank, first of all, thanks for listening. And we will be back with more shows this week, including Being Wrong. <laughs>